Well, you guys, I'm so excited to jump into God's word as we continue our series, Elohim. And Elohim is the Hebrew word for spiritual beings. And it's used all throughout the Old Testament as a category term, kind of like the term mom would be used of lots of different kinds of moms, and they would all fit into that category. But then a brother and a sister might say, hey, it's mom's birthday. And when they would say it's mom's birthday, they would be speaking of a specific mom. And in a similar way, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew writers would talk about Elohim as spiritual beings, but then they would talk about Yahweh, It was their spiritual being. It was their God. It was their father. And they talked about Yahweh not as an equal among all spiritual beings, but they talked about Yahweh as the originator, the eternal uh, first cause creator of all things, including other Elohim. And so what we've been doing uh, over this series so far and what we'll continue to do is we want to look at the landscape and kind of the mental Uh, approach or the mental space of the Hebrew biblical writers. Because in a Western modern culture, we live in a different worldview, but we live, uh, we, we don't live in the biblical worldview necessarily any longer, but we live in the same world that the biblical writers are writing into. So the world hasn't changed, but our view of it oftentimes has. So we've been going back and trying to say, Bible, would you teach us what it's like uh, to understand both the created realm in which we live and look and touch and smell and taste? And would you also help us understand the spiritual realm where we can't see, but it's eternal. It's not temporal, but eternal. And so we've been doing that. The first week we talked about two realms and how there's a spiritual realm that's eternal and a physical realm that's created and temporal and how they overlap one another and how we're now post Jesus living living in the overlap of those two worlds in a certain way once again, and not all the way to completion yet, but we are living in a version of that right now. And then last week, we talked about the types of spiritual beings, and we talked about angels, and we talked about what it means to be a human being, Uh, and we talked about that a little bit last week. This week, I want to talk to us about something that I'll label today redemptive narrative. Uh, Really, when we look at the Bible, and we look at spiritual beings, and we look at the created order and the uh, the spiritual order, what we understand is that there is a meta-narrative that stretches over the entire Bible and really over the entire scope of what God is revealing to us through the scripture. And it it leads us to questions. uh, it, 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 It gives us an answer to questions like this. Why is the world like this? Uh, why did God make it like this? What am I here for? Why is there evil? Why is there injustice? Where does beauty come from? All of these kind of questions. Where does evil come from? Uh, these are all questions that we ask. And until we kind of can zoom back and look at the meta narrative of what's happening in both of these realms that once again do overlap, uh, a lot of these things just don't really make sense. Let me start out today and actually give us a little bit of an analogy. We had a cat. His name was Max. I called him King Max. And uh, he actually passed away several years ago, but uh, when he died, it was kind of an unexpected thing. And when he died, I remember one of my kids, they were little at the time, and they said, uh, they said the phrase like this, they said, why did God take him so soon? And I remember thinking back, you know, that's, it's a complex question, actually, and there's a lot of assumptions in the question, which again, it, it was great that they asked it. It's a natural question, but there's a lot of assumptions inside of that question. And it is a complex question, and it is a complex answer. But one answer that we know is this, is that actually God didn't take him. Uh, we actually know that there is a natural world and that the natural world operates according to a certain set of rules and laws and that we exist in this world in its current state. And that kind of leads us to ask the question that we even started with today, which is why is the world like this? Why did God make the world like this? Why did God make a world or create a world where death could exist? Why did God make a world where evil would exist? Why did God make a world where injustice could exist? And uh, again, it's a complex answer, but a couple of just kind of baseline things is that um, God didn't intend for it to be this way. Uh, God never, it, God never created the world with this as the intended goal. God obviously knew that this would be an option, this kind of world. Um, and, and so people will ask the question, well, can God be all good and all powerful and allow a world like this? And so I just want to remind us as we get started today is that God didn't make the world this way, but God knew that the world could be this way. And he apparently thought it was worth the world possibly being this way to get to an end result. And now that actually begs the question of what is that end result? And that's where it gets us into what I'll call redemptive narrative 
or the meta narrative that sits over all of scripture through the entirety of the Bible and human history. And I don't pretend that I'm going to answer everything today or that we're going to solve all of those tensions today. I know even watching today, there's people that have lost children. I know that there's people that suffer with chronic illnesses. I know that there's all sorts of pain. And so I don't want to give any trite answers. I also do want to point us heavenward and have us look at what God is revealing to us through the scripture and through these two realms coming together. And we can start to eliminate some options for why the world might be like this. And options that we can go ahead and eliminate is that God's not good. We know that he is good and that God is not powerful. We know that he is powerful. And Again, you say, how is that possible if the world is like this? Well, again, God didn't make the world like this, but he created a scenario where a world like this was possible. And it is possible that he did it for a reason. And I want to lean into that reason today. Why in the world would God create a world that could be like this? And I want to do my best. Um, What is God's end game? If we want to ask it like that. Let me give you this little phrase that I wrote in my notes. God's end game, I believe, was to create a unique type of being, one that would reflect the image and glory of God, one that would be a hybrid between body and spirit, temporal and eternal, created and creative, surrendered and responsible, limited and yet powerful, carrying the capacity for relational sacrificial love as the supreme ethic living eternally in loving union with him. Now, I know that's a lot of words. Let me paraphrase what I just said. I believe that God created a world that was good, but had the capacity to be fallen in order that he could get a certain kind of creature or a certain kind of being. That God has an end game, this redemptive narrative that sits over, this meta narrative that sits over the Bible and our lives and both realms together. And I'll give it to us today in three words. And I believe that those three words help us understand the Christian worldview in this area and also help us understand that God may have an end game that even though it might not make immediate sense to us, that it's possible that the world that was created is worth the end game that God has. Let me give you the three words. Uh, They are creation, fall, and rescue. Creation, fall, and rescue. And I believe these start to answer some of the questions about why we find ourselves in the kind of world we find ourselves in. Uh, Number one, if you're taking notes, is creation. Who is God? Uh, He is the personal, moral, infinite first cause. God, in a short word, is the creator. Uh, Many people live their lives self-centric, that they are the center of their lives. As Christians, we live our lives God-centric. That really, that all of reality doesn't start with me. It actually starts with God. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that the story uh, begins and ends with God as the center. It's a God-centered world. And that is in a God-centered world, there's the created world that God made. And then there's us. But it is a God-centered world. And that means that I'm made on purpose for a purpose. Um, I remember years ago, Uh, There's a gentleman named Greg Kokel, and he uh, does a call-in show. People can call him in and ask him theological questions. And someone called in, and and I'm paraphrasing their question, but it's a question that many of you probably have and many of us have talked about. And basically what they said is, hey, if it's a God-centered world, and God is good, and God created the world, and God created us on purpose for a purpose, why is there evil? And then the question is, did God create evil? Why is sin and evil in the world? And Greg Kokel fielded this call, and um, the questioner said, did God create evil? And Greg Kokel answered it, and he said, uh, the answer is no. God didn't create evil. The follow-up that he said was this, did God create the possibility for evil? And the answer to that is, of course he did. Of course he created the possibility for evil. And so the question is, if God only created good, how could evil have come along? Because God creates the world and he steps back and he says, it is good. How do you get evil from a world like that? And the answer is that God gave us free will. That God wanted to create a world in which free will was possible. And we'll get into this in a second, but he wanted to create a world in which love was possible. And in order to have a a world where love is possible, you have to have a world in which free will is possible. And God created the world good and he created us good. And then he gave us the power of free will, knowing that he didn't create the world for evil, but he created a world in which evil was possible. Now, uh, let's say it like this, a couple analogies. Let's say the creation of a car. 
Do you know that Henry Ford dreamt up the, the automobile and the creation of the car? And when you create a car, it means that the car can be used by the driver for different purposes. The car could hit someone and cause death, but the car could also rush someone to the hospital to save someone from death. So the question is, is the creation of the car worth it? Well, you would have to go back to the creator and ask him. And in this situation, it's a temporal scenario and it's about cars and Henry Ford, who's not infinite, but God is infinite. And so the question is, God, is it, it does it make sense? Is it worth it to create a world where evil is possible? And apparently God thought that it was. Another analogy is a brick, uh, a brick creator, a brick maker. You know, with a brick, you can actually throw it through a window and cause harm, or you can actually build a hospital to save life. The brick is amoral, but actually what you do with the brick really matters. I remember years ago hearing a gentleman named Vince Vitale uh, share about a buffet. And he said, at a buffet, he said, everything on the buffet line, there's only good things. He said, but the way that I put them together can equal not a good thing, right? The buffet has all good things, but the way that you put them together or maybe the amount in which you put them together can equal not good things. So we understand this, that just the creation of something good can actually lead to something bad depending on the way that it's used. So God did not create evil, but God did create free will. And God wanted a world in which eternal love, a self-sacrificial eternal love was possible as the driving force of all life. So I've, I've shared this before, but love is not love if it's coerced. If I hold up a fist and I say, say you love me or I'll give you a knuckle sandwich, that's not love if you say that I love you. That's called coercion. So love requires a choice. Choice is predicated on the ability to have free will and to actually really have it. And God did not create evil, but he did create choice. God created Adam and Eve in the garden. He created a good world. And then he said, hey, there is this one tree that I do not want you to eat from. The day that you eat from it, you will die. And he gave them a choice to exercise their authority, their, their actual choice. And biblical theologians call this uh, the dignity of causation, which means that God gives us the dignity that our choices actually do really matter and have real consequences. And in Genesis 1 through 3, you can read about the rebellion of the human race and how we went our own way and we began to try to do our own thing. And we began, instead of worshiping and trusting God, we actually began to try to take the seat of God. And by the way, humans are still wrestling with that same thing even today. But all the way back at the beginning of Genesis, this is what we see. And what we see is that God created good things with a free will and that through our own choice and free will, we actually chose to go away from God. Because with a free will, we can choose love or we can choose the absence of love. Galatians 5.14 in the New Testament says this. It says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22.36-34 says, teacher, which a, a rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, if God created love and then God created choice, which means we could choose love or choose not love, the question is, what's the opposite of love or what's the absence of love? Because dark is actually the absence of light, right? Dark's the absence of light. Cold is the absence of heat. Death is the absence of life. Hell is the absence of God. And evil is the absence of love. Evil is when I use my free will that was given to me by God to not serve someone else or to care for the needs of other people or the greater good, but to actually use that free will for my own benefit at the expense typically of someone else. Now, I have choice, you have choice. And when we ask questions about the world and why is the world the way that it is, we can solve some of that just simply by looking at how human beings use their free will. And we understand that God didn't create evil, but he created the capacity for evil because he gave us choice. God didn't create evil, but he did create choice. And, you know, I can choose, uh, I can decide that I'm going to fly to the moon and I can flap my arms to fly to the moon, but that won't happen because <laughs> I'm limited in my free will, in my choice. 
That is to say that our choice is not unlimited. We are bound and constricted and limited. Humans are limited as created beings. So let me say it all like this. God created us limited in our capacity to choose, and yet God created us with the ability to choose. And so that's how we exercise our free will. And the ability for love, a world of love, means that free choice is necessary. And if free choice was necessary and actually truly created and given, that means that we could use that free choice for the purposes of evil, not love. So free will misused is the opposite direction of love. And in the kingdom, that is evil. So did God create the world like this? Well, God created the world good. And he created us with free will and the capacity to love. But God didn't create evil. God created choice. And therefore, God did create a world in which evil was possible. And so there's this first idea in the Bible, in the meta narrative of the redemptive narrative of God, that God created all things good and he created humans as in his image. And then he gave humans free will so they'd have the capacity to love and to choose God. And that leads me to number two, which is the fall, which is the rebellion, which is when we go our own way. And C.S. Lewis said this, he said, then there are two points he says that I want to make or summarize this is at the end of uh, a chapter titled uh, The Law of Human Nature in the book Mere Christianity. And he says there's two points that I want to summarize or bring to close. He says, first, that human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way. And they cannot really get rid of it. So he says, look, people know that there's kind of this created law, this created order. And he says, secondly, they do not, in fact, behave that way. They know the law of nature, but they break it. And then he says, these two facts are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe that we live in. And the Bible tells us at the very beginning of this redemptive narrative that God created the world and he created us and he created things good and he gave us free will. And that we have a certain sense in which there is a moral arbiter of the universe, that there is a moral law giver, that there is a God who's good and all powerful and that he created things a certain way and that he has a certain responsibility over us. He, he asks us to live a certain way. And C.S. Lewis says, we all have that sense. And then C.S. Lewis says, and yet we all actually don't live that way. We actually all choose our own way in different moments, in different seasons, in different ways. We, we, we do all sorts of things to justify our behaviors and to, to, to do our own thing. In Genesis 3, it says that after they sinned, they, they hid from God and they covered themselves with, um, with uh, clothes that they had made for themselves. We begin to exercise in our own authority. We begin to exercise in our own strength. And we actually move from a place of trusting God and serving God to a place of trusting in ourselves and serving ourselves. And the Bible calls this rebellion. And the Bible says that that is actually the beginning of evil. That's the beginning of death. That's the beginning of, uh, of, of, of the separation of this, the spiritual realm and the natural realm, that they're broken apart from one another for a season. Ephesians 1.4 says, even before God made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. What does that mean? It means this, God, yes, created the world good. And yes, he gave us free will. And even though it wasn't his desire for us to misuse our free will, God knew he was creating a world where that was a possibility. And God knew that eventually we would, we would misuse our, the power that was stewarded and trusted to us. And so what he did, the Bible says in Ephesians 1.4, that from the foundation of the world, before he created the world, he actually established the plan for Jesus Christ to come and to save us. That Jesus would actually come and save us from our rebellion. And, you know, uh, years ago, I heard an analogy kind of about the world in which we live. And it said this, it said, a parent takes a toddler to a doctor who sticks the toddler with a needle. On the way home, the toddler might think something like this. I don't understand. My parent took me to a, this place to get stuck with a needle. And not only that, my parent actually paid the guy to do it. And you can see how a toddler would step back and say, that makes absolutely no sense at all. But a few years go by and a disease begins to stalk the land. And the toddler now, a child uh, that's a little older, begins to think to themselves, if my parent would not have done that, I would be a casualty of what is currently destroying the people around me. And the idea there is that time is a necessary component for understanding why temporal pain and suffering can, return, can result in something eternal or greater or more, more holistic. And so for us, 
understanding the spiritual realm and God as the creator and how the fall and our use of our free will actually brought us into pain, we can actually start to see that God has a plan to use temporal pain to actually bring us back into union with himself, but not as robots, as ones who use their free will differently. I'll say it like this, people who use their love differently. Exercising our free will poorly allowed the possibility for temporal evil and eternal relational love. And this really, you guys, is what's so interesting is that being a human being, the stakes are high. The way we choose and the way that we believe and the way that we live really does matter. And really with our free will that God gifted us, we live in a world where we are agents of great evil and pain or great good and love. And we have those choices to make. And if you really step back and consider what C.S. Lewis said, he said, we all have a sense that we should live a certain way. And yet we find, or maybe don't find within ourselves the capacity to live that way. You can read about that in Romans 7. The apostle Paul talks about it. He says, what I will to do, I don't do. And I, I assent that it's good to do, and yet I don't do it. And I, I do what I don't want to do. Why do I do that? And he says this, who will rescue me from this body of death? And then Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the idea, you guys, is this, is that though God created all things good and we took our free will and there was a fall, that from the foundation of the world, God had a plan in place to rescue us from that state. And the person is Jesus Christ. And the good news is this, is that in our state of, 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 of choosing, but not knowing always how to choose well, the Bible says God is fully vested in our rescue, in our redemption. And through the person of Jesus Christ, God came down, lived a sinless life, hung on a cross to prove that he's fully vested in the process of our redemption. Jesus hangs on the cross and says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And Jesus goes into the grave and he resurrects again. He shows back up again and he says this, I'm paraphrasing Jesus, but he says, look, I have power over death, hell, and the grave. I, yes, I was a physical human, but I also am an eternal creator. And I will bring those together once again. And I'm telling you, if you will trust in me and put your faith in me, I will forgive you of your sin and bring you back into right relationship with myself. And that is really the Christian message is that, yes, God created all things good. And yes, we've misused our free will. And now we live in a world that is broken and that is under the sway of sin and death. And yet Jesus comes back to give us a way out of our own rebellion, to say, come back into eternal life with me. And Jesus is fully vested in that process, so much so that he dies on the cross to pay for our sin and to bring us back into relationship out of his mouth as he's dying on the cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Basil Mitchell told an analogy in the context of World War II, and he said this. He said, suppose that in the middle of World War II, there was a local man who meets a resistance leader. Uh, let's say Nazi Germany, I think, was the, the context he was speaking of. And he says, uh, the resistance leader says to the, the local man, I am the resistance leader. If you trust me and put your alliance to me, uh, we can work together in many different ways but we will never talk openly in this way again. You may see me in an enemy uniform arresting one of your family members. You may be confused, but you will not know that I'm releasing your family member up the road to freedom. You may not understand all that I do, but at the end of the war, when the codes are broken and the secrets are revealed, I will explain everything. For now, I need you to trust me. And C.S. Lewis actually takes that analogy and he says, that's really the type of current exist existence that we are living in. We are in enemy territory. We're living in a world that is not our home. And sometimes we understand and sometimes we don't understand. But we do know that God is all good and we know that God is all powerful and that he created a world that was good and a world in which he could relate with us. We went our own way with the free will he gave us and we broke it. But he's come to restore it. And he told us through scripture, if you will trust me, yes, the war is not fully over and all things are not brought back together once again. But if you will trust me, trust what I tell you, I will explain everything in the end. And here's what we know. Evil is truly evil. We also know this. Good is truly good. And we know this. God is truly good. 
and truly all powerful. And you ask the question, how do we know that God is all good and all powerful? That's where we started, Pastor Scott, was you were asking, why is the world made like this? Why is there evil? Why is there suffering? Why do all these things take place? How could God allow something like that to happen? Well, we don't know every answer to that question, but here's what we do know. We can eliminate some, uh, we can eliminate some possibilities. We do know God is all good. And we do know that God is all powerful. And you say, how do you know that? Can you see it in our circumstance? And the answer is no. We don't always see it in our circumstance, but we do see it in the cross. And we see it in the person of Jesus. And we see, as, uh, as uh, Basil Mitchell said, we see the leader show up, the resistance leader show up and say, listen, you may not understand everything as we move forward, but here's what I need you to know. I'm talking to you now openly. And in Jesus, we have an open conversation with God where we see God coming and paying the price to redeem the human race at his own expense. He's the creator, and then there's a fall, and God comes as a redeemer. Let's make this a little personal. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, we know that if there does exist an absolute goodness, he's talking about God, it must hate most of what we do. This is the terrible fix that we're in. If the universe is not governed by an absolute goodness, then all of our efforts are in the long run hopeless. But if it is that we are making ourselves enemies to that goodness every day and are not in the least likely to do any better tomorrow, so our case is hopeless again. He says we cannot do without it and we cannot do with it. God is the only comfort. He is also the supreme terror, the thing we most need and the thing we most want to hide from. It is after you've realized that there is a real moral law and the power behind that law that Christianity begins to talk. When you are sick, you listen to a doctor. All I am doing, says C.S. Lewis, is to ask people to face the facts, to understand the question which Christianity claims to answer. And they are terrifying facts. I wish it was possible to say something more agreeable, but I must say what I think is true. Let me paraphrase once again what C.S. Lewis tells us. He tells us this, God created all things good. He is the divine lawgiver. He is the divine good. He is, as C.S. Lewis says, the absolute goodness. He created us with an ability to choose and we chose against him. And we see the brokenness and the death that comes from that choice. And C.S. Lewis says, look, you have to assent to the idea that there is this law that we all kind of understand fundamentally. And yet we understand that we're not keeping it in our own ability. And he says, we are both in trouble with the divine absolute good, and we're also dependent upon the divine absolute good. He says, it's the thing, God, that we cannot do without and we cannot do with. He is our only comfort and he is also the supreme terror, the thing we most need and the thing we most want to hide from. And he says, I'm paraphrasing him once again, until you understand that predicament, Christianity makes no sense. But if you understand that there's a, there's, a, there's a spiritual, eternal realm and that there's a created order that's temporal and that they overlap and the way God made it and created it, and the way that he put us into the story. When you consider the meta narrative of the scripture and the redemptive narrative of the scripture, we start to understand the predicament we're in and we start to call out to God as our only hope. And the good news is this, is that there aren't just two words in this redemptive narrative, which is creation and fall, but there's a third word. And it is when Jesus shows up to rescue. And that's the third part of this narrative is rescue. What is God's end game? What is God up to? Why is the world like this? Why are we in this kind of creation? Why did God make us? What exactly is going on? And I want to propose to you today that God created a world. He didn't create evil, but he did create choice. And he didn't create a world for evil, but he did create a world in which evil was possible. Because, an evil, uh, because um, a world where evil is possible is possible because of free will. And free will not only gives us the capacity for evil, but also the capacity for love. And God decides to deal with sin and evil without destroying human beings to bring humans back into a relational state with him by their own choice, by their own free will. And I believe that God is actually creating a people. Remember, we started with this at the beginning. God is creating a family of unique created beings, reflecting the image and glory of God, a hybrid between body and spirit, temporal and eternal, created and creative, surrendered and responsible, limited and powerful, carrying capacity for relational sacrificial love as the supreme ethic, living physically and eternally in union with a loving God. 
You know, God created a certain kind of people. And it's a people who have the capacity for evil and the capacity to inflict pain upon one another. But it's also a people that have the capacity for love and self-sacrifice and goodness. And God says, I'm going to let you choose. And we all have that sense, don't we? But then the problem is, is that so often we choose the wrong thing. And that's why from the foundation of the world, God said, I'm sending Jesus to you to help you in the place where I'm your only hope. And that gives us the rescue, that Jesus is actually the rescuer. Jesus is the redeemer. Jesus is the one who comes to actually pull us out of the miry clay and to set our feet on a rock, that Jesus is our hope and Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, that Jesus is the one that we put our full hope into and our full trust into. Jesus is the one we look to. Jesus is the one we call upon to help us in our time of weakness and our time of need. Jesus is the one that we that we ask and pray to change our hearts and our lives from the inside out so that we will look and behave more like him and less like ourselves when we choose our own way. Jesus is the rescuer and Jesus comes to redeem us, to rescue us from our sin, to pay our debt, to offer us unearned salvation, to give us a relationship with God that is restored, to give us a home in heaven, to actually bring the two realms together once again and allow them to overlap in our lives because we're physical beings, but we're also spiritual beings. And we were created not to run on our own fuel, if you will, but to run on the fuel of the love of God. And Jesus brings us back. 1 John 3, 8 says, the reason the son of man, a son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. The reason Jesus came was to destroy the evil and the pain in the world and to invite us back into a love relationship with him. Ephesians 1, 4 and 10 says, even before the world was created, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Verse 10, and this is the plan. You ask, what's the plan? What's the end game? What is God up to? Ephesians says, and this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ everything in heaven and on earth. He's bringing it back together again. He's redeeming it all back together again with a people who serve him and love him and glorify him and magnify him and walk with sacrificial love as a supreme ethic out of their own free will, supported and aided by the grace and empowerment of God. That's Jesus's end game. Romans 8, 19, 21, and 23 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves have the first fruits of the Spirit groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. That at the end, Jesus is bringing all of this together once again. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, 18, for our light and momentary troubles, that's the, the temporal world in which we live, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Do you see it? We're living this life now. God created this world to be a place and a container and an experience in which the human beings that he created with free will could learn to exercise their free will away from God and also for God and to see how that works so that we would use our own free will, that we would walk through light momentary troubles and afflictions, the temporal world that they would be achieving for us in eternal glory that far outweighs all of it, that we're learning to use and exercise our free will for love, not for hate, for good, not for pain. And that's what God is creating. Verse 18, so we fix our eyes, not on what is seen in the created realm, but what is unseen. What is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that who believes in, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Creation, fall, rescue. John 16, Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome 
the world. And you guys, as we talk about Elohim and we talk about the spiritual realm and then the created realm, and we talk about where we find our feet in this whole thing. Yes, we know there's angels and demons and there's God and there's us and we're hybrid creatures and we understand all of that. As we come together, we understand that Jesus is the one who has solved all of the equations and invited us through his grace to be victors over all of it. In this world, in this temporal place, we will have trouble, but we know that the temporal problems we face are actually creating within us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And we are a people that are created with a free will. We are people that are created with the capacity to do great good and great evil. And so the question today as we close that, that, that sits before all of us is this, what will you do today with the free will that you've been given? Did God create evil? Absolutely not. Did God create a world in which evil was possible? Absolutely. Because he created human beings in his image and in his likeness who had the capacity to choose. And the dignity of causation that their choices actually had consequences and actually matter. And today I want to remind you of that, that what you do matters and what you say matters and who you trust matters, and how you live, and how you think, and how you speak, and what you do with your free will absolutely matters because we are humans that have the capacity for great good and for great pain and suffering. And the redemptive narrative over all of the Bible and over all of human creation is this, is that God created you and I good, and he created us powerful with a free will to choose. And we chose our own way. And knowing that we would do that, God had a plan in place for a rescue. His name is Jesus. And he came and he died on a cross. And he said, if you will put your trust in me, I will not only bring you into eternal life with myself, but I'll put within you a new spirit so that you will live and walk and choose differently. And today I want to remind you that you have that choice every day. You have the choice every day to exercise the free will that God has gifted you with for good or for evil. It really does matter. And as we continue on in the series, we'll look at some of the other parts of the eternal uh, spiritual realm, of, of the created spiritual realm. We'll look at more Elohim. But today, what I want to remind us is that we were created, that we fell, and that we've been offered rescue. We can go our own way or we can put our trust in Jesus Christ and we can build his kingdom. If you're here today and you've never started a relationship with Jesus before, you can do that right now today. The Bible says today is the appointed time. It's now. Today is the day to, to say, God, I need you in my life. I, I realize you've given me a, a free will and that I can choose. And I've seen in my own life that I have the capacity to cause pain or the capacity to be a bringer of good. And God, I want to live my life with you today. If that's you, pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God that you came and you offer me salvation and rescue, not because I earn it, but because you did it for me on the cross. I receive you right now as my savior. Thank you for your rescue of me. I confess my sin to you. The places in my life where I've gone my own way and done my own thing and exercised the ability for free will that you gave me in a way that doesn't honor you and please you. Today, I confess those sins to you and I ask you to come in and to give me a fresh start. And I ask you to come in and empower me to live in a different way. Thank you for your love for me. Thank you that you care for me. And I thank you that today I start a new life with you. Not just in a temporal sense, but in an eternal sense. Thank you today for eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that, if you could text the keyword element to 97,000 and on that form, it says, I made a decision for Jesus today. If you check that box and let us know, we would love to hear from you. And uh, the Bible says there are angels in heaven celebrating because of the decision you made today. And if you're here today and you've already made that decision, I just want to challenge you and encourage you to make it again today to not, we understand we don't lose our salvation. Okay. But we understand that we make a choice daily to surrender ourselves to living in submission and surrender to God. And I want you to make that prayer afresh today. And let me pray with you. And we're going to go into a time of worship. Father, we pray all of us, all your sons and daughters, we pray, God, would you teach us what surrender looks like? And would you teach us, God, to live our lives through the lens, God, of your redemptive narrative over our lives? God, would you teach us to live through the understanding that we were created good? We were created in your image and in your likeness. And God, we were gifted free will. And God, yes, we know we've gone our own way. And yes, as C.S. Lewis said, God, we hold those intention that we know there is a way to go. And we also recognize that so often we go our own way. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come in and to help us, 
to empower us, God, to rescue us. Jesus, thank you for your rescue and to come in and to change us from the inside out and to bring us into the kind of people that you envisioned for us to be from the very beginning of the world. God, your end game was that there would be a family of people, God, that live their life, God, through the lens of eternal sacrificial love, that that would be the driving supreme ethic of our lives. And God, that we would live with one another and that we would live with you because we choose love. And so God, thank you for that today. We go into a time of worship and Holy Spirit, we ask you to continue to speak to us in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, we love you all so much. Let's go into a time of worship and we will see you back here next week.